Hi, and welcome back to my channel, Richard Tang, CEO of Zen Internet. This is my first interview of 2024, and I'm delighted to welcome Dan Ramsey, Chief Marketing Officer of City Fibre. Dan, welcome to Zen. Thank you, Richard. It's great to be here, Zen. So I spoke with Greg Mesh, your CEO, back in November 2022. Now, obviously, a lot has happened with City Fibre and in the alt-net world generally. Yeah. Let's start off with build build plans because you're still by far the biggest network fight full fiber network builder alt net in the uk yeah um apart from open reach so just how big are you today and where are you going in terms of aspiration yeah good question well our uh plan is unchanged you know we still are on course to be substantially complete that's 8 million bill by the end of uh, 2025. And at the moment, we're just over 3 million RFS available for our customers. Uh, so that's a million RFS that we did in 2023. Uh, so continue to grow at a really strong rate. And uh, the, plan is, uh, the plan is going well. We are powering ahead. Had a great 23 and looking forward to a great 24 as well. Because you, you actually ramped up your build rate, haven't you, in 20, towards the end of 2023? Doing about 100,000 a month. Yeah, it was really quick. A, it's a little around. <laughs> yeah. I find it difficult to get my head around that number of premises going online, actually. Yeah, the scale of the uh, of the build machine is, is something we're really proud of. We've now got that to a really, really efficient uh, machine. Like Dan, I've done the maths in my head. We've got two years to the end of 2025, or a bit less than two years now. Um, you've built just over, three, uh, I think, 3.4 million homes passed um that means you got 4.6 million to build in two years i make that about 200,000 a month that you'll need to do from now to the end of 2025 if you're going to hit your 8 million target seems like a big ask yes well you could <laughs> you did the math and you could see that uh, you could see that, that implies a bit of a ramp up yes um now there's lots of different ways we can get to the eight million of course um so we could get there through our own entire build organic uh program we can get there through acquisition we can get there through combinations of both build and acquisition um so you know we are we still believe we're on it but there's different ways we can get to that number right and how are you going to get to it? Then? Ah, well, that's obviously the killer question, Richard. I knew yeah. you'd ask me that. So, I mean, uh, you know, we've been quite public about our ambitions when it comes to acquisitions. Uh, you know, it's not a surprise to see that the market was going to consolidate at some stage. I suspect we're on the cusp of some of that consolidation uh, now in early 2024. Um, there's lots of alt-nets out there. You know, the, the tail of alt-nets is a long tail of some quite small providers when you get down into positions, you know, eight, nine, 10 and onwards. And, uh, you know, we think lots of those are probably going to struggle to be viable entities for forever. Mm. Um, and that gives us some, some rich opportunity, I think. I mean, th there's been a lot of talk about the big consolidation mm. in the alt-net industry mm. and everyone mm. that I speak to said, look, there's not going to be a hundred alt-nets when all this sort of washes through. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they, and there might be one, there might be two, yeah. there might be three. And we've seen little bits of consolidation, a few acquisitions, but they've been really small scale. And I mean, what's your take on the industry of the whole consolidation piece? And also for City Fiber, when does it stop making sense? I mean, talking to, certainly when I talked to Jeremy Shalow from Netomnia, he was like, well, we're building, I can't remember what his build rate was. I think it was 50,000 a month. And he said, there's no point us buying an alt-net that's got like 40, 50,000 prems passed because we could just build for another month and we're already there. I mean, what, what, what's the city fiber to Yeah, and, that, and the, you know, the, the, the cost and the rate of build versus buy is going to be an equation for us as well. You know, clearly, um, why would we build anything if you can buy it pre-packaged, ready-made out of the box for the same or less and vice versa? You know, that, that is, a, of, of course, a consideration. Um, I think the economic environment we've got in the UK is clearly playing a factor in that. You know, interest rates are substantially higher now than they were 24 months ago, which is obviously putting some pressure on, well, puts pressure on every business in the UK in various ways, but particularly some of those smaller investors, uh, smaller alt nets that wouldn't have had access to vast amounts of capital. You know, that will be a factor. And ultimately, that will 
play a role in whether how long they can be viable entities for. You know, that's not a surprise to anybody. So, you know, there's 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 good news and bad news to the economic shakeout that I think will happen over the next twenty four months or so. And and, and time scale wise, I mean, I'm sort of thinking in five years time the big consolidation will be largely done. Yes. Um, is that in line with what you think? Or I mean, when, when are we going to see City Fibre City Fiber gobbling up some big names? Or when are we going to see another big name gobbling up City Fibre? I mean, is that a, is that a possibility? Well, I think that's the million-dollar question, isn't it? You know, you'd be a rich man or, if you could predict a multi-billion-dollar question. Well, it, <laughs> no, it completely. You know, you'd be very... Uh, You'd be a rich man if you could predict exactly when these things were going to happen. I think most people's experience and what they're basing their judgment of the timing of these things on is the consolidations we've seen in an industry. So, you know, I've been in the industry nearly 20 years. You know, the, the cable consolidation, which has ultimately ended up at Virgin Media's door, you know, was a lot of small local cable companies all coming together. Uh, that took sort of three or four years, I think, before it really shook out into probably predictable pattern. I but I think most people's view is roughly aligned to a similar time scale to that. Um, it will be, I think, uh, you know, we won't end up at the end of this with, you know, Overreach, Virgin Media plus five others. You know, we will end up with probably three, I think, because in most mature markets, that's what you tend to see in terms of infrastructure competitors. You know, if you look at mobile markets in the UK at the moment, there's really three. Uh, there's not, that's not a coincidence, I think. And there's an equivalent number in. Uh, in alt nets as well. So 100 alt nets will become one big. I think net. ultimately they will. Right. Ultimately they will. And, you know, we certainly see ourselves at City Fiber as the sort of biggest alt net by some distance yep. as being the sort of acquire, uh, not the acquiree, yep. uh, and being, you know, leading that charge to some extent, which you'd expect the biggest player in the market to largely do. Yeah, absolutely. And let's talk about VMO2 because there was something in the press last March that they wanted to buy you for three billion pounds um, <laughs> that then all went quiet what, what was all that about is 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 there another offer is there a real offer was it ever real oh well richard i think you know better than to believe everything you read in the press i don't think uh, i wouldn't believe uh, that story at all you know we weren't in active conversations with uh, vmo2 uh, at that stage at all and so yeah there's no there's no grounding to that let's go on to the funding because if city fiber are going to go on a a a big acquisition drive to hit that 8 million number, then, you know, you're going to have to buy up some big names. That's going to be really expensive. I don't think anyone in the industry, including the investors, predicted the level of interest rates um, in City Fiber themselves. You, you, you've got a pretty... Well, from my from my from my point of view, a pretty eye-watering level of debt, as have all the old nets, to be honest. Um, and when I spoke to, to Greg in November 22, he said a lot of that had been hedged, which had been good fortune for City Fibre, but surely that's, that's going to be putting some pressure on the business, even with the hedging in place. Well, a lot of it's timing, of course. A lot of it depends when you raised it previously. You know, most of our debt that we've got today was raised during a period of very low interest rates. You know, interest rates at the moment are coming down. You know, most people's bet is that we're back to sort of what we what we previously called normal levels, you know, uh, you know, within the next 12 to 18 months or so. So it's largely about timing, about when you raise it. Um, I think that uh, ultimately, of course, we are largely financed to do lots of what we want to do already. So it does also come back to that buy or build equation, which is, you know, if it's a more rational thing to do to uh, buy it at a rate that's cheaper than you can equivalently build it at, then, you know, it's kind of the same money, just using it to do a different thing. So that will be part of our equation as we run the slide roll over. Uh, there are opportunities. Yeah. Let's talk about overbuild because everyone that I speak to in the industry is, is, is dead against overbuild. Just say like it, it just dilutes the investor value, um, and of course, the idea is that given that there will be a big consolidation, overbuilds is just you're just wasting money. So you want jigsaw pieces that you can put together. But what what have you actually seen happen in the industry? I mean, how much overbuild have you seen? How much has City City Fiber been overbuilt? How much are you overbuilding other alt nets? I mean. So we, we, we had to try to avoid overbuilding other all nets for obvious reasons. You know, that's not good for them or for us. Uh, we are about 70% not overbuilt today. Right. So, you know, that's that's probably where we want it to be. Where will it go in the future? Well, you know, it kind of depends, doesn't it? If you want to have three successful scale, uh, you know, 
full fibre networks in the UK as a, as a long run trajectory, then inevitably there's some overbuild attached to that. Um, there's good size to overbuild as well, of course. That is choice and competitiveness in the market, which ultimately is good for uh, UK PLC. So I think it's a bit more nuanced than overbuild or not. It's more about the type of overbuild and how it plays out and the timing of it is, is probably the challenge for us. But, you know, we're not actively trying to do that. That wouldn't really make sense for mm. us or for our ISP customers, I think. Yeah, certainly. I, so I've had feedback so for some of our individual consumer customers. They quite like it, having yeah. a choice of open reach and city fibre. Yeah, yeah. Um, and don't forget as well, it's not all, you know, the reason people don't like overbuild is they think it's disruptive and it's a bad use of resources. So lots of that is you actually using the same infrastructure to do the overbuild, right? It's using PIA or something like that. And so it's not actually massively disruptive for the actual consumer because most of the actual infrastructure is already in the ground there already it's just being reused for a separate purpose yeah so just a bit of a jargon buster pia's physical infrastructure sorry access it is which is open reach's product that it rents out to people to allow its access to its own ducks and poles yeah but you you don't know you don't exclusively use pia you Correct. do lots of Dig in, and I've seen we do mixtures. Yeah, trenches in Rochdale. Yes, we... correct. Yeah, no, we do mixtures. We do uh, again. It's a cost effectiveness question as to what's best and most cost effective way for us to reach our our target homes and uh, offer the biggest available footprint to our customers at the best rates. Just on the consolidation again. So the predicament for these smaller players. Um, I mean, what, what when I think of the uh, the prospects for Altnets. You know, you can get big like City Fiber, you can get bought up and you know, people want to, if you get bought up, that's a success. But there is this risk that uh, I think particularly for smaller alt nets that they'll end up in this um, stranded position yeah. where, you know, they've built maybe a few tens of thousands of homes. Yeah. They get overbuilt by a much bigger player and the economics of the original business model are just never going to stack up. And, and now... Counter to that, I had Sean Royce from Quickline saying that that their business, you know, very rural focused, had a niche that could um, that could persist for many years. And I'd just be interested in your view of to what extent should smaller alternates be worried about getting stranded, or actually is there an opportunity to persist as a niche? Altnet, maybe partic maybe just in the rural areas um, for, for many years when the big three continue to do their thing. Is that realistic? I, th I think for some of them it probably will be realistic because the cost effectiveness of um, any other scale network you know, being extended that far into a particularly rural area might be really challenging. Um, and so some of them are probably quite likely to succeed, I suspect. Whether they are successful financially is a slightly different question. You know, do, Are they actually going to be highly profitable? remains to be seen because of their scale might mean that they're you know very expensive for the consumer or not very profitable for their investors you know that's a slightly different question but you know I they, they could succeed you know we obviously we are uh, a big partner for government in Biddy UK and the reason we are for that is because we believe that offering you know access to rural customers is an important sort of social contribution and a viable economic opportunity for us and and, and that's a more recent thing your focus on BD UK is more recent um and has that been driven by the changing competitive land, landscape in the towns? I think it's a, it's, it's a rational commercial decision for us. I think it's kind of as simple as that, really, which is, you know, we've got now four BDUK contracts awarded to us, a public subsidy of around £300 million. And uh, that gives us a good opportunity to reach out to a market that, you know, without BDUK would have been underserved and, and probably, you know, be a... Uh, you know the sole FTTP provider in that in that area, offering access to those customers, uh, those homes. So you know that's good for our ISPs because they get access to a market they wouldn't have been able to reach. It's good for the um, uh, homes themselves because they would have been stuck on slow old copper forever. And so uh, that's got to be a good thing for everybody, I think. Yeah, well, it's certainly good for Zen because I, I mean we love providing service over your yeah, network exactly. to those rural customers and and, and and all the customers. So four BDUK bids that you've won so far. Uh, I believe you've got ambition to do more. What can you 
Can you say anything about that? Well, we, n- nothing more has been announced uh, so far, but you know, you would, uh, you'd anticipate that if you've won four so far, you're going to continue to participate in that programme. That's all I can say Definitely. for now. But uh, you know, we will make a success of those four. I'm absolutely convinced of that. And actually, the, the construction on the first one of those four in Cambridgeshire starts very, very soon indeed. Okay. Uh, one thing I've heard about BDUK contracts is that they can be incredibly onerous. Um, and for example, you need to connect every last home before you get a penny out of the government. And if you have a of one objecting farmer, for example, then you're just not going to get your money until you sort that out. So uh, obviously it sounds like City Fibre hasn't yet got to the point where that could become an issue, but I don't know if you've got any thoughts about... Well, it's, it's, uh, you're talking to someone whose job prior to this one at City Fibre uh, originally was working for the government. So your question a bit about sort of consumer, uh, government red tape and bureaucracy around contracts is very familiar to me. Um, so you're going to sort them out? <laughs> well, I, I mean, we've... Um, we actually think that all the contracts and the obligations that come under those uh, BDUK commitments that we've got to the government are very workable for us, actually, and give some level of flexibility on both sides, from the government's point of view in terms of what it's going to fund and from City Fibre's point of view, to work perfectly well. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't you know, we wouldn't have won four bids and we wouldn't continue to be an active participant in the programme. So I don't think that's a problem for us. Um, inevitably, any full fibre builder you know, has to build a range of properties to get the scale that they want right and you know not every uh town that you visit can look like a perfectly straight line which is what you would ideally want and look like a series of terraced houses very close together otherwise the economics of full fiber bill would be very different they're all different and i think when you've got to the scale that we've got and the expertise that we've got you know tackling something like bduk which will be a bit different because it will be more rural doesn't phase us at all i think we'll make that work no problem good good to hear is it a good use of taxpayers' money, though? Jeremy Shalow from NetOmnia said it's a waste of £5 billion of taxpayers' money. Um, in contrast, Sean Royce from Quickline said it's a great use of taxpayers' money. <laughs> I mean, his whole business is built up on BDK. Now, City Fibre do a mix. So, good use of taxpayers' money or, or not? It's a good use of taxpayers' money. I have to say, I completely disagree. I wholeheartedly disagree with Jeremy there. Sorry, Jeremy, if you're listening. But no, it's definitely a good use of taxpayers' money. I think if you went to some of these locations, I've been to some of them that we're about to build in in Cambridgeshire, and you looked at the poor connection they're getting and how it impacts on those people's lives, it is very difficult to say it's not a good use of people's money when you're literally standing in someone's front room and they're trying to do some very basic things like order their online shopping, not not very advanced things like online gaming with low levels of jitter, you know, and that that's struggling and that's impacting their everyday life. It, I challenge anyone to go and visit that and then say it's a bad use of taxpayers' money because the social good that it's bringing is obvious to everybody, right? And that's really why we should absolutely be doing this. Yeah, I think I think Jeremy's argument was that the areas were defined <laughs> before the government knew what the effects of competition would be and if you let the competitive process play out a lot of those BDUK areas would end up being covered by private sector money I mean that that was his argument that's a bit different to the way you've explained well he's 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 saying that uh everyone that submitted their plans to BDUK is wrong in effect because what he's saying is the the money the the forecast that people have made of where they're going to build will turn out not to be true and they'll go to those areas anyway which i find a very strange argument to make which is any alternate is trying to put a flag in the ground somewhere and try to publicly say to all the other alternates and other builders don't come and build here right and he's implying that they've somehow got that wrong or they've made a mistake or they're going to change their mind later on which i think is a very strange position to take i can't see that any alternate would have any interest in, in kind of doing that the other implication he's making as well is is that um it's fine for some parts of the uk to wait four or five six years however long it will be before those providers eventually turn up and that they can those homes can exist in the slow lane for that period yeah. of time that 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 would make no sense if you're stood in the living room in that village I visited in Cambridgeshire where they've got such poor connection they're struggling to do their online shopping. Yeah. There you go. Well, Jeremy, there you go. <laughs> I think it's 2-1. <laughs> anyway, let's talk about the Cabinet Office because you, you, you came to City Fibre from the Cabinet Office and prior to that from BT Correct. EE. Yes. Uh, I'd be really interested to hear uh, potentially, you know, why such a shift? Yeah. Uh, but also the the difference in working with City Fibre, 
working with BTE and working in the you know working for the government what what are the things that are different if you're compared with the job you're doing today actually what are the things that are similar as well yeah yeah well bit, bit of context I'd spent 12 years of my career at BTE I was uh, chief, uh, consumer marketing director there latterly where I was responsible for marketing all of the products in its consumer division and then having done that for quite a period of time I was like I've got to, I'm going to go and do something completely different so I became a civil servant for just under two years uh, and I worked in the cabinet office and then number 10 for a good chunk of that time and I promoted the UK to the world so my job was literally sort of market UK PLC which was trying to grow trade and investment and lots of things um, and then joined City Fibre two years after that uh, which was genuinely fascinating to work at the central government. Um, somewhat scary how government really works when you see it close up. You know, it's a bit like when you see a magician reveal his tricks. You know, you don't, they don't look quite as special. It's a bit like that. Um, but, but very interesting as well. And, you know, as a product, you know, if you want to call the UK a product, because ultimately as a marketer, yep. that's what you're looking at. You know, the, the UK is the most amazing place and you don't always realise it within it. In fact, if there's one thing I could change about the UK, it would be its opinion of itself is far too undervalued. And if you actually go overseas and look at how the rest of the world sees us, it's vastly different. Um, but moving from government into city fibre to your question, Richard, very, very different. Uh, the government was very bureaucratic, very slow. You know, it's all the things you would think it would be from the outside. Um, City Fibre, very fast-paced, very dynamic, very entrepreneurial, much more uh, purpose-driven than government, actually, um, and much more focused on getting the right things for its customers. Um, obviously, we're a growing organisation where, you know, we're doing lots of things for the first time, and so sometimes in City Fibre we learn by doing as you would expect any growth organisation to kind of do. But, you know, when you look at the sort of people scores that we've got and the culture that we've got within it, you know, all of the people that I know and work with at City Fibre are so proud to work there. That's what really makes the difference about our company. I think if there's a sort of secret source to our business that, you know, you want to keep more than anything else, of course it would be, you know, the infrastructure access you've got, but it's really the, the DNA of the people mm -hmm. that make the difference. Brilliant. Last question, and this is a really important one in the in Altnet world. If you go back two, three years, the big focus was build, build, build. We want to pass as many premises yeah, as possible. Yeah. I think with the with interest rates, economic pressures, the focus has shifted to okay, maybe we'll build a little bit slow. We got to fill these network up, networks up yep. with paying customers. So, as chief marketing officer of City Fiber. What is the magic formula <laughs> filling up an alt net network with long term loyal paying customers? What's the magic formula? I think, I think you're asking me a question the way the answer is chargeable there, Richard. <laughs> uh, well, I, 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 seriously, though, I think there, there isn't a single answer to that. I think it depends on the ISP and what they're trying to achieve. But all I would say is there is a consistent answer. One of the, one of the most brilliant bits about my job is you can you can see the whole industry from the inside because obviously you, you get a bit of a peek inside each ISP, including our friends at Zen, of course. And um, some of the smaller ISPs have to play a bit more on price than some of the larger ISPs do. You'd, you'd expect that. Um, some ISPs like Zen play excellently to service because they've got a real USP there that they can substantiate in awards and things like that. Um, but generally, it's about making a consistent message, simple, and executing it over the long term. I do see lots of smaller ISPs in particular chopping and changing their message or where their message isn't really the same through each touch point. You know, they'll say they're good on price in one channel and then they'll talk about service in another. And you have to be quite single-minded and consistent over a period of time to do it. Because it is, let's be honest, it is a, it's a long game that you're trying to play to build a brand position and to make people understand it. And sometimes people can chop and change a bit too much. I think if you, if you have the basics of a winning formula, stick to it. That would be my overall guidance. And what about the specifics of, um, you know, you've got, I mean, we're in January 24 now. So let's say you know that the, you're going to build some premises in, in April or June or July this year. So you've got a date for the build. Yeah. You've got this whole palette of, marketing opportunities at your fingertips yeah. you've you know you've got obviously all the digital marketing stuff yeah. you've got door knocking you've yeah. got leaflets yeah, you've yeah, got yeah. billboards bus yeah. shelters yeah. fireworks that <laughs> paint your name in lights to the yeah. evening sky 
again, you want to get most bang for your buck, but yeah. you also want to fill up your network. So, I mean, what are the things that have you that have you you've seen that work well in terms of acquiring customers, and what are the things that you've seen um, maybe look good on paper, but when you try them, complete flop? Well, I, um, the, the the key one that's got quite a big range attached to it is door knocking. So door to doors generally got quite a bad perception in the UK. Most people don't like the disruption attached to it. However, we've got a number of partners that are exceptionally good at it and have got very high customer satisfaction scores through it because of the way that they do it. So they tend to do it in-house. They tend to pay their people over a long-term incentive, not a short-term sales bonus. Um, and they tend to get a lot of lead generating through it, which generates them repeat business. Whereas we do often also see some other providers that do door to door, but in a completely different way, which is very, a bit more aggressive, a bit more short termist, which tends not to work. Um, equally, we see people that do excellent local digital campaigns, uh, really targeted about what's special to that area. So they'll focus on their own locality as a reason to buy from them. But there's no single answer to that. But the, the, the trick is really getting very good at a particular customer segment or particular uh, focus point of your proposition and really executing that uh, kind of consistently and i think if if anyone wants more information then there's a uh, large consultancy fees uh, <laughs> well we, well i mean that. one of our points of differentiation <laughs> actually is the team of people we've got actually to help our isp succeed right and a team of marketing people that work for me that come out and work with isps like zen to come and, and come and help them grow because their growth is our growth which other networks perhaps don't do. Yeah, and look, that's absolutely the case. You and your team have been working with the team at Zen to market services on the City Fibre Network for, for since we originally signed our deal together and that it's been really valuable. Um, look, that's been absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much, Dan, for joining me and thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that.